Um, if y'all are watching this YouTube channel and y'all might have been for a while, you'll know that we stream a podcast, we do a lot of things like that. Uh, years and years ago, I tried my hand at making kind of like short form, mid form YouTube content, and frankly, YouTube pissed me off with uh, constantly moving the goalpost on what they would monetize and what they would allow, so I kind of backed off from that. But I think it's time because I have some subjects I want to talk about, and some of these things are just better discussed like this rather than doing a podcast. So let's start with off-grid communications, which is something I've started talking about more recently. I've gotten into it very, you know, pretty deep for having been into it for such a short amount of time. Uh, we've talked about it on the podcast a couple times, but I thought this might work better for some people. So let's start with, you know, like most people's default method of communication is a cell phone. And there's no good reason not to include that as a default method of communication. They're reasonably efficient, they're reasonably, um, you know, trustworthy as far as whether or not they're gonna work, they get the job done. And a cell phone gives you the ability to talk to people literally around the world, which most other methods of off-grid comms are not going to be as efficient at. So like, there's no really good reason not to, not to expect your cell phone to be your first line of communication. I think, most people would accept that. Um, to that end, I say you probably need to, you know, plan on having something like this at the ready. A little USB battery pack, charging cables. You know, like, if this is going to be our primary method of communications, we should probably make sure it's going to work properly and reliably and stay charged, things like that. But what do we do when cell phones stop working? Or let's start with what makes them stop working. So most people... Most people think cell phones work like phone to phone. Let's use these two FRS radios as stand-ins. Most people's thought process is, I talk on my phone, it connects to my buddy directly, and it talks to them. And that's not how cell phones work. Um, skip ahead a couple minutes. If this is all not, if this is, none of this is news to you, then skip ahead. If not, bear with me for just a second. So that's like a lot of the layperson's perception of how a cell phone works. You know, I, I, I dial a number, it contacts this phone that my buddy is holding, I talk to him. That's not how really how cell phones work. What cell phones do is when you dial a when you dial a phone number, it links up to a cell phone tower. And it communicates with that tower and says, find my buddy and connect me to him. And then that cell phone tower routes the call through to here. So there's not really a good analog for this in the, the uh, radio world. Like, the closest thing you could say would be like a repeater system, but even that's not a great analogy. But the point remains that this phone and this phone talk to each other through that thing, through that piece of infrastructure that is beyond our control. And this is where a lot of people in the preparedness world start to develop some mistrust in cell phones, not as can't use them as a primary source, but being fully reliant on them. Because... There's a piece of this equation outside of our control. And anybody that's been through a major natural disaster knows that even if the cell towers and the cellular network doesn't go down, it's usually clogged up pretty badly from reduction in services, from emergency services using the cell phone towers because they do get priority on them, um, just from people calling and overloading the cell towers trying to check on their family members. Like, we saw this after Hurricane Katrina, we saw it after Hurricane Ida, AT&T service, cell service went down, like, voice and data for about 24 hours after Hurricane Ida hit. So, that wasn't an enormous problem, you know, I mean, we still had food and water and all the things we needed, but we had family members we couldn't check on, because, unfortunately, you know, my whole family is AT&T, and so did my in-laws, and so did my parents, we were all in the affected area, so... Fortunately, the situation unwound itself. We managed to get in touch with them before we had to just load up in the truck and drive on the roads to go find them and make sure they were okay. But it still begs the question of that piece of this equation that's beyond our control is a reason why a lot of people start to look at off-grid communications. How can I talk to someone that I'm not standing right next to without cell phones? So this is probably where most people start is these little bubble pack radios, FRS, family radio service. Uh, you get them in Walmart, you get them in most, you know, most good, most stores. 
the it'll say 35 miles on the package that that's complete bs these things like on mars couldn't go 35 miles not in the most perfect conditions the, simply the curvature of the earth i mean sorry to upset the flat earthers but the curvature of the earth means that line of sight radio communications is first and foremost going to be dictated by how tall you are and how far over the horizon your radio signal can reach and then once it hits that cresting point it'll go the same distance to the other side to the other person who's about the same height you are so three and a half miles maybe up to the five five and a half if your buddy's really tall i mean that's about the most you're going to get out of these things but it's also worth pointing out that these frs radios they're capped to two watts of power maximum they have very, very small, not great antennas. Um, and they operate all these, this, this and GMRS, which I'll discuss in a second, these operate in a frequency range called ultra high frequency or UHF. And those frequencies are bounced around pretty hard by things like trees and buildings and foliage. And again, it's line of sight only. So these things, are where most people start, but quite frankly, like we only use these for camping trips. Uh, these are throwaway radios as far as I'm concerned. Um, more recently, we made the jump into GMRS radios, which does require an FCC license. And quite frankly, if you're one of those people that's like deathly afraid of giving the government your information, I'm sorry to say, but they already have all of us on the list anyway, so you might as well just embrace it. Uh, get a P.O. box and use that for your GMRS license if you're really that worried about somebody being able to search out through your license call sign, figure out where your home address is. I don't worry about it because, again, the, the, uh, we're all on lists list anyway. It's 2024, guys. But uh, GMRS radios operate on some of the same frequencies as FRS. The GMRS, as a service is limited to 50 watts it's capped lower than that on certain channels um this little handheld is it's not really material what brand it is it's a Beofeng gm 15 pro but you know this any most of your handhelds for gmrs are going to be capped to about five watts most of them spit out about four and a half watts that's still double the power of an frs radio and you can do things like put a nice big whip antenna on it or even you know, we'll talk about it in another video, but like there are things you can do on the antenna end of this to drastically improve your range of performance. But you're still, you're capped to about five watts. But the other thing that GMRS gives you the ability to do, which is debatable whether or not it's useful for SHTF or, you know, grid down disaster scenarios, but this gives you the ability to access repeaters that are operating on the GMRS frequencies. And as an example, the nearest repeater to us is in New Orleans. It's about 25 miles as the crow flies away from me. And I can hit that repeater from my driveway if I need to. It, it's spotty, it's scratchy. If I drive down to the lakefront about a mile and a half south where I have less in between me and the lake, I get a really nice return signal. And, you know, a, a repeater can extend your range as far away as you are from it, if you can reach it, it can extend your range the same distance the other direction. So that's worth pointing out. Uh, sometimes it can extend your range even further because that repeater, most of those repeaters, you know, they'll push out 40 to 50 watts of power. And if it has a decent antenna height, that height could be, in the case of this one, it's several hundred feet high. And height is might, is the old saying with GMRS, or with UHF, ultra high frequencies in general. Height is might. The higher you can get your antenna, the better results you're going to have. But um, those repeaters can extend the range of these little handhelds dramatically. But again, those repeaters, just like our analogy of the cell phone tower, that repeater is outside my control. If that repeater doesn't have a backup power source or solar or something else, it also goes down in a grid down emergency. So maximum range on something like these little handhelds, again, you're probably talking three to five miles. Uh, could be substantially less, by the way, if like that handheld is inside this house and you're trying to blow RF energy through the walls and then through your neighbor's walls and then through the trees, you might be as low as a mile to a mile and a half of range. It, it really, this all depends a lot. 
that's still dramatically better than cupping your ha hands around your mouth and shouting down the street at somebody. But obviously, handhelds in GMRS, are go you're going to have to accept a range limitation with that. Um, if the most you need to talk is a couple of miles, that might be perfectly acceptable. I would make sure that before you depend on them, whatever you believe the maximum range you're going to need to operate them at, you try that and make sure it'll work because it is so dependent upon elevation and vegetation and the environment. It's so dependent on all that. You really do have to kind of like take what I or anybody else says with a grain of salt and try it yourself with your equipment and your environment so that you know if it's going to work at that range or not. But, um, you know, it begs the question. You and somebody else have a pair of handhelds. Y'all are talking to each other. Or maybe you're not talking to each other. Maybe maybe the, the, the environment you're in is limiting your range to less than what you can tolerate. Like, what's your next step? What was my next step after I got a couple of handhelds? And I guess before I show you that, like, let me also point out, I believe in doing things like buying extra radios and having backups and spares. So what I did in an effort to try to keep all this junk somewhat well arranged is I took an old mechanics tool bag. <clears throat> um, interesting little note, AR mag shingles are the perfect size for most of these small GMRS radios. And having a whole bunch of them in this carrier means they don't smack around, the screens don't get broken, they don't get jacked up. And most importantly to me, these battery contacts don't have a chance of getting shorted out because shorting lithium iron phosphate batteries just seems like a bad idea. I also took some, uh, some extra vacuum bag and made another little shingle just again to make sure that the battery contacts don't short out, kind of protect things. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of documentation in here, instructions for these, just in case I have to do some, some field programming and I don't remember it. I've got boxes of extra cables and junk and doodads. Uh, got a whole tube of spare antennas. So these are the little rubber ducts and the longer whip antennas. And down in the bottom of this, I also have a, a, an abrief tactical or folding antenna. I, it's okay. It's... It, it, it doesn't seem like it's as good as like a 771 style whip antenna. It's better than a rubber duck. It's it's a tool in the toolbox. Like there are certain situations where it comes in really handy and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I guess that's about it for handhelds. I mean, like I said, I feel like I've tried to lay out kind of like this is what your, these are what your limitations are going to be with handhelds. It, it's a necessary part of off-grid comms. You are not always going to carry around a big bulky radio or be t want to be tied to a home base station or something like that. You really need to start here. And fortunately, like there are good radios on the market that are in the that are under fifty bucks per radio. Uh, there are some substantial more expensive ones that have lots of cool features, but I feel like this is a good place to start. Um, FCC license is thirty five bucks. The uh, FCC website was designed by Sadis, and uh, it's bad. It's really, really bad. If you search on YouTube, there's good walkthroughs for how to navigate the FCC's nonsense. But get get the license. And the only thing, the only reason I'm going to push people about getting an FCC license is, I've heard more than one person in the preparedness community state, "I got the thing. I'll figure out how to use the thing when I need it." And I push back against that so hard and so repeatedly because. No, you're not. You're not going to figure out how to use the thing at the moment all hell is breaking loose. You're going to freak out, run around like a chicken with your head cut off, realize that the batteries aren't charged or it's not programmed or something bad is going to happen. And I only say this because I've been there. I've been there. I think if you get into communications just like you've probably gotten into firearms and you've gotten into all these other disciplines that all relate to preparedness... You have to practice it. You have to train in it. You have to know it well enough and know your equipment well enough to know how to operate it. And you're not going to do that on the day that a Cat 4 hurricane knock, you know, wipes out five zip codes and drops three trees on your house from personal experience. You're not going to learn it then. You have to learn it now. And that kind of helps if you can legally speak on that radio to other people. Just saying. Like, I don't... I don't think the FCC is running around finding a bunch of people. I don't want to be the first one either. And I don't want you all to be. So 
uh, a $35 FCC license covers like you, your spouse, your kids, your in-laws, your parents, your brothers and sisters. It covers everybody but your dog. It, it really has a very expansive list of people that are covered under it. You could almost argue one license per family and everybody's covered. Uh, you're all, you all share the same call sign, but that's not a big issue. But like I said, $35 license, $50 to $100 for, you know, two to four radios to cover your family. Maybe some money spent on extra antennas or upgraded antennas or extra battery packs. I do recommend extra battery packs. That's all money well spent. That gets you into the game. Where do you go from there, though? Where did I go from there? All right, so I'll have some pictures showing up up here in the uh, corner, picture and picture and all that. But um, my next step after I got a couple of handhelds, got them programmed, figured out how to use them. Um, programming is very dependent on the radio model. All I'm going to tell you is most GMRS radios, you can do the majority, if not all, your programming right from the faceplate. And I encourage you to learn how to do that so you can change things on the fly as you need to. Um, something like a programming cable that would plug into a laptop or a desktop, it speeds the process up dramatically, especially when you have multiple radios to program. Like, I've got four of these GM15s, ostensibly for three family members and a spare. But once I got one of them set up how I wanted, it was a really quick process to download that program, save it on my desktop and my laptop, and then push the exact same program into the Earth 3 radios. So, especially for being able to program multiple radios, it's a huge help. Um, NC Scout, who should not be, his name shouldn't be new to anybody in the preparedness world, uh, met him, really nice guy, really cool, knows a ton. He wrote a book called The Gorilla Guide to Beofang. And one of the things he points out is, from his perspective, programmer radios, if that radio were to become captured, can become a problem. Um, I think in most people's use, I don't see that as a huge problem. Most people are going to program, you know, their local repeaters into it, and all that's publicly accessible information. I would say that if you are, if you're operating on ham, and you are more concerned about the frequencies you use falling into other people's hands, then yes, that's probably good information not to have to, to encourage people to remember the, the frequencies and flip through them on the fly as opposed to program minute for gmrs it's a channelized radio service anyway so quite frankly you know there's only so many gmrs frequencies you can just scan through them until you figure out which one everybody's talking on not applicable in this world um but the next place i went after i got a handful of hts was I went and put, first of all, I put an antenna on the top of my truck. Now, this is a Nagoya 72G, if I recall correctly. Um, it's a mag mount antenna. You don't have to drill holes in your roof. I, uh, I routed the antenna along the wind, the windshield channel and then down in under my hood. And on the Tacoma, it's not hard to take the uh, AC drain and pull that out of the grommets and feed the, feed the wire through and then put the drain back. Made for a very simple way to get the antenna on my truck and the end of the lead into the truck without having to drill extra holes or make any permanent modifications. And I feel like that's a good place to start. Um, the 72G also comes with the adapters you need to be able to plug that antenna straight into a handheld, um, which in this case, this uses a, uh, this as most of your GMRS Radios uses an SMA type connector. This is an SMA male. It included a female to female adapter and all the stuff you needed to be able to hook the uh, the UHF type connector or PL259, SO239. Don't get bogged down in the weeds of all these different connector names like Google it. There's information out there. But the point is that 72G came with the adapters I needed to plug it into this. And that did improve the reception range of this radio a fair bit. In practice, it didn't really improve the transmitting range much. I was able to tag the New Orleans repeater from the lakefront uh, using this handheld, again, at four and a half watts, using the Nagoya 72G. I was able to tag it and get a repeat back, but in other use, when I tried to talk to someone across the repeater, uh, the comment I kept getting back was my, my signal was really weak. Lots of static, not very loud. So obviously, even though I had 
a better antenna, the power limitation of a handheld was still affecting me. Um, the next thing I did was I went and got a Radioddy DB20G, which is up here now. Um, it's a 20 watt mobile, and to be fr frank, when you make the jump from handhelds into mobile radios, the biggest changes you're dealing with from a functional perspective is you are now dealing with you know anywhere from three to ten times the power of a handheld radio and you're dealing with the fact that it's a mobile unit it's wired into your vehicle so as long as your vehicle is running you have all the power in the world you're no longer tied to this little battery and the amount of runtime that'll give you you have ostensibly limitless power as long as you have fuel to run the vehicle and they integrate into a vehicle much better you know, I, I've got uh, I've got uh, the the handheld clip to my dash, so it's within easy reach. The form factor for being in a vehicle much, works much better. Prior to that, I used my handheld again, plugged into the Nagoya 72G. I had a a little hand mic that usually was just sitting in a cup holder or something, and that got the job done. But a mobile unit worked much better. Um, with the mobile unit, for the first time, I was able to hit the New Orleans repeater from my driveway, which I could never do on 4.5 watts with a handheld, even with the upgraded antenna. Uh, for the first time, I was able to legitimately, depending on where I was in town and how close I was to the lake, and again, the closer I am to the lake, the less stuff between me and the tower. But for the first time, I was able to have really good conversations with people on the repeater, getting strong returns, clear, clear speech, they could hear me, I could hear them, things were working out great. So um, that's where a lot of people go next, a mobile unit in the vehicle. And when you start hearing people talk about like home base stations or home GMRS units, they're literally taking a quote unquote mobile unit that most people put in their vehicle and they're hooking it up to a power supply and a permanent antenna at their home. We're talking about the same units, just different form factor. And for the people who want to have you know, mobile unit or better performance at their home, a lot of times they make that jump into a home base station. Um, since it's the same unit, we're talking about the same kinds of power, 15 to 50 watts. So what's the benefit to a home base station versus a mobile unit in your vehicle, or the fact that it's in your home and not in your car or your truck? The biggest difference here is that when you Again, like we started this conversation talking about how GMRS is ultra high frequency radio host spectrum and it's line of sight and it's very much interfered with by vegetation and trees and bushes and homes and so on and so forth. So the higher you can get your antenna, again, height is might. The higher you can get your antenna, the better. And this is where your home base stations really come into play because unlike a mobile unit where the height of my antenna is somewhat dictated by the height of the antenna in the vehicle and even that's kind of capped to a certain degree because let's call it what it is. If your antenna is too high, you start running into clearance issues. Um, things like, you know, not that I think this is a huge issue, but like drive through fast food places or low bridges, or if you're driving um, in a rural area and you have like trees and foliage and everything kind of overhanging the road, that can become a problem. It's snapping the tip off your antenna makes all kinds of bad things happen. So there's a reasonable limit to how high of an antenna you can run on a mobile rig, but once we're talking about something at home, the limitation is you. Like, do you want to put the antenna in your attic and deal with the consequences of that, or do you want to have it in the house? Or do you want to have it on a 500-foot tower in your backyard? Or do you want to have it on a 20 or 30-foot tower in your backyard? Those are decisions you get to make, but the higher you get the antenna, the better performance you will get out of that exact same mobile unit in your home that was pre we were previously talking about being in your vehicle. So that would be the natural next step is I've got handhelds, I've got a mobile unit, obviously I want to go get a home base station, except that's not exactly the route I went. And um, I'm going to reposition the camera to get a better look at what I'm, what or to kind of get everything laid out. The direction I went is really specific to like my reasons for getting into preparedness, my personal boogeyman, the thing that I always think about when somebody says emergency or SHTF. So a lot of my preparedness really centers around preparing for the thing I expect to be my biggest concern. Um, not to say that there aren't other concerns or that your concerns, if they're different, are valid, just this is me. This is the direction I went. 
Um, a home base station and a 100 foot tower in the backyard, quite frankly, is just not useful to me for a variety of reasons. Um, I live on the Gulf Coast. We get smacked with hurricanes frequently, frequently. Um, we had an F2 tornado go through a town 20 miles east of me just a few months ago. We had an F3 tornado wipe out the building I worked in several years back. And I was sitting there on the first floor listening to it blow the roof off. Um, just the other night, we had a bad thunderstorm run through here. And even though the damage we had was nothing, uh, like uh, some other, not my home, but some other places in the area reported some wind shoes, some wind damage, but like the same, the same front went through Houston, Texas last night, and it knocked out power, it knocked shingles off roofs, it collapsed a crane, it did some really pretty bad things. So given that if I have a tall tower and that tall tower gets knocked over by the wind or the hurricane or the tornado, and all of a sudden my comms plan just fell down with the tower, obviously that's not useful to me. Or if I was gonna go that route, I better have a backup to what happens if that antenna goes down. And fortunately, I started down the road of what can I do to have local regional communications after a major event. And again, most of my preparedness is all based around the idea that like, I don't have solar panels on my roof because if the solar panels get torn off by the wind, they're not doing me any good. So I need things I can deploy after an event and keep in storage and protected before and during the event. And that is all, that dictates a lot of how I do prepping. Um, some people might kind of wave that off and say that that's an unreasonable um, concern or I'm going about this the wrong way and you know you, you prep your way or frankly jump into the comment section and tell me how I can do better because I've been in preparedness for a lot of years but I'm still I'm still doing it to the best of my knowledge with my methods and I don't know everything maybe the way I went is not the best way to go maybe it is but um, let me reposition the camera let me get a couple things set up and I'll show y'all where I went after we dealt with the mobile unit all right, hopefully this isn't too jarring. I know the camera's really close to me, but like I'm trying to get y'all to be able to see this. So what I have done is I've and I've gone down the route of building a GMRS man pack. And there's uh there's several good channels on uh on YouTube. Um Tech Prepper is probably the best one I can think of. Really he does a lot of deep dives into building man packs. There's other content out there that's very good, but he's probably the most well established. But um, the concept behind a man pack is something that really comes from military radio operations. Um, in the military, you know, when I was enlisted, not everybody had a radio. Let's start there. Uh, the people that did have radios had like a whole assembly that went down into their rucksack and that they were the radio operator, RTO, radio transmit operator. And the whole point of having an RTO is so you can tell the RTO, hey, tell the rear headquarters, whoever, our higher element, the thing and he can radio it to them and that was kind of the way it had to be done back then um in more recent times radio among squads and among individual elements has become much more commonplace so now the rto has really kind of graduated out of the role of i'm the only one with the radio into i am the one with the big boy radio so instead of being the guy with the little bitty radio who can only talk you know short range because we're talking about certain frequency limitations and line of sight and yada, 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 limited power. Now we're talking about he has a bigger radio with a battery, with a better antenna, that he can talk over longer distances. So everybody in the element can talk to the RTO via a small radio, and then the RTO can communicate back to the rear. That's kind of the theory behind it. So what I've done is I started off with a set of uh, pack frames from a company called Armalock. Um... Honestly, I kind of looked at, I looked at what they had made. It made sense to me. It does the job very well. I considered briefly DIYing my own set of frames because I like to do that kind of stuff. But quite frankly, for the cost involved, I couldn't have done anything near this nice. It would have looked a little rough. So um, I went ahead and just spent the money and there will be a much more in-depth talk about this thing and how it's built, but we'll, we'll, we'll go over like the nitty gritty of it. So set of arm lock frames. Uh, this is actually strapped to 
the little fake Pelican case that a Holosun LS321 comes in. And I've got extra cables and fuses and all kinds of stuff like that down to here. Things I don't expect to need very often, but I want to keep on board. So this not only is a standoff to make the radio stand up higher up in the pack so that the faceplate and everything is near the top, but also to give me extra storage. Thank you to one of my uh, good friends for that. Because originally I was going to do this with like a block of wood or something. And he was like, you really want extra storage? Well, he was right. I'm just stubborn. I had to figure it out myself. Um, Amazon special lithium iron phosphate battery. This is a 20 amp hour battery. Um, I've seen these done with like seven amp hour batteries for lower power transmissions, mostly, mostly with HF or high frequency rigs because they just get away with much longer distance over much less power, especially if they're doing Morse or, um, if they're doing digital, uh, digital packet service, they can get away with a lot less power. But to have decent range with UHF, you really need to be able to throw some power. So the need for a more powerful radio kind of drove the want for more battery. Um, I don't think I'd go any smaller than 20, 20 amp hour, me personally. Uh, that That's just me. You could get away with 10, um, except that you with small batteries going to be less weight, which is a good thing, and less talk time or receive time, which is not a great thing. But it's all in what, what your wants or needs are. Um, 20 amp hour battery. This radio is a Wuxin uh, KG1000G because, again, as I started building this, I kind of got into the mode of if I'm going to build it, I want to build it right. I want it to work well. I want not, maybe not like premium equipment, but I want the best equipment for the money. And I think the Wuxin is the radio to beat right now. For all the other 50 watt radios out there, they all kind of left something out there that didn't vibe with me and this was the one that really checked all my boxes it also has user selectable power from a maximum of 50 watts transmission all the way down to 5 watts so i can use the minimum amount of power necessary to get the contact made and save the battery which is preferable for me um, this battery i will tell you that uh the manufacturer proudly advertises that it will output up to 20 up to 20 amps of power before the BMS shuts the party down, and they're full of it because that battery chokes the fun if I try to transmit on high power. I can go up to 20 watts, no problem. The minute I try to transmit on high power, which independent testing has shown this radio will pull about 10 and a half to amps, give or take, on high power, it immediately the BMS shuts down. So good on your Nermac. You um you, you overestimate your BMS a little bit. Um, there's another company that makes lithium iron phosphate batteries that are very comparable called, called BONO. They're, they're very well liked in the ham rate in the, the mobile and the portable ham radio community for a good reason. It's a great battery. It's four times as expensive as this one. And it's on my to-do list eventually, but, um, being able to throw 20 Watts up into the air is more than enough for my needs. Most of the time. Um, antenna. This is, I think this is an HYS brand. I got it off of Amazon. It's a, it's a GMRS tuned antenna. It has a BNC connector and it fits very nicely into this relocation mount from an SO239 or PL259 to a TNC connector to a BNC connector and then this just clips right onto the top. So if I am operating in such a way that I want to be able to like put the pack down, stand up comms quickly and if quickly and easily, I just take this out of one of those plastic tubes that keeps it protected, smack it in the top of the radio, plug my handset in, turn power on, and I'm ready to rock and roll. Um, in my experience, I have been able to hit the New Orleans repeater from my driveway using this, so I have at least the range that I have with my mobile unit and the truck mount antenna in this package. What's coming, and when we do a deeper dive on this, by then I should have that other antenna option, and we'll talk more about that. But what I have coming is an N9 Tax roll up J pole and uh, a, a, a telescoping fishing pole, which will make a really nice field expedient field mask or field mast. But that will give me potentially more range because I can get the antenna up higher and it's got better gain than this tiny little thing does. So. That's that's where I went. And so I, I jumped all the way over home base station to build a man pack. Because again, it's portable, it's deployable, 
It can stay in the house when it's not in use. I don't have an antenna hanging up in the backyard waiting for a tree to hit it. This kind of fit my needs. And um, to support all this, <clears throat> lithium iron phosphate battery charger to keep that battery hot. Um, nice heavy gauge pigtail that I can plug into either the cigarette lighter port on my truck or into the power panel in the bed of the truck so I can run this radio not on that but directly off the truck. And when I do that, by the way, I'm running straight off the, uh, the rear power panel in the bed of my truck, I can transmit a high power no problem. So it's definitely 110% is that battery being a pain in the butt. And then in emergency use, I even have this little pigtail, which I can just clip onto a battery with a couple of alligator leads. Um, based on how small these are, I don't think I'd really trust these for high power. But in an emergency, if I need to just bypass that battery, I don't have a vehicle handy, I can find power where I need to. And that's kind of the reason, that's kind of the way I built this was I wanted to have the flexibility to operate in different ways. I wanted to have the ability to get power where I could find it. I wanted the ability to like make this thing work when I needed it to work. And so far it seems to be doing a, a fair, a fairly good job. Um, I have some plans down the road for, uh, improving this, increasing this thing's capabilities. Um, maybe, maybe down the road. I've given thought to putting in a, a home power supply here in the office, maybe a 20 foot mast in the backyard, as long as I have a way to stand it up and lower it ahead of storms. But um, I've considered being able to turn this into a home base station and that really wouldn't be that difficult. All I would need to do is unstrap the pack frame from this storage box, unscrew, the uh, antenna relocation out of the back of this, screw a piece of coax into the back of it that runs to an external antenna, and then just have a, a pigtail that will adapt from Anderson power poles to some bare leads or some banana plugs or even some ring terminals to go into the uh, the home, you know, the uh, the power supply. So I could utilize this as a home base station and still have it largely configured as need be to go into a man pack very quickly and easily. But this is the direction I went because I have handhelds, I have a mobile in my truck, I am considering building like a small, um, kind of a small radio bag for my wife to have in her vehicle so that she can quick deploy radio in her vehicle if she needs to. I just don't think my wife is going to want to have like a radio permanently installed in her center console like I have. So I'm trying to like work around that and give her the capabilities I have when she needs them, but not when she doesn't. But this is, this was kind of my last step in GMRS was I wanted the ability to have more range with a handheld, more flexibility, more portability than I get out of a, uh, more, sorry, my cat is trying desperately to knock over my tripod because she's a brat and she's not getting attention right now but I wanted more portability than I can get out of my mobile unit, more flexibility. I wanted the ability to either operate off of a whip antenna or be able to like string a, J, string a roll up J-pole up into a tree and get some nice range out of it. I wanted, I like to build systems that are as flexible as possible because I cannot always anticipate the environment I'll be operating in or the operational needs. So I'm always looking for how do I make this more flexible so that if that situation comes up, I haven't backed myself into a corner by building something that only works one way. And that's what I tried to do here. So um, I will probably be deep diving into this thing, especially at a later date. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's more here in terms of like the construction and some of the reasons I built it the way it did that bear pointing out. I'm just not really at a place yet where I want to uh, go into a lot of those things. I uh, honestly, I want to do more testing on this because I've only just begun to test it. Um, it works, but I haven't totally figured out what its capabilities are. And I want to know what that is. so I can talk to you all about it intelligently, but that's, um, that's off grid communications in a nutshell. Like the reason I went it down this road and I started into this discipline was really because it's not because I'm like, you know, trying to get ready for the apocalypse. And it wasn't because I don't want the government listening to me on cell phones, even though they do. It was more the f fact that like in the, in the same spirit of everything else I've done in preparedness, where when 
plan A falls through, you go to plan B. I wanted a plan B for how I get in touch with my wife. She works about four and a half miles away from home and I work from home for the time being. So my question always was, if the cell phones went down tomorrow, how would I talk to my wife? And how would she talk to me? And that's what I'm working towards. Um, unfortunately, on those occasions where I have to go back into the office, I'm on the other side of the lake. So to account for that situation, I would have to get her some kind of way to be able to talk to the local repeater, which this thing will be able to do in the very near future from here at the house. So she can get home, she can use this and talk to me through the New Orleans repeater. That shouldn't be a problem. But let's say I'm at home, she's at school. How do I talk to, uh, what, I'd like to be able to talk to her four and a half miles simplex. Simplex just meaning no repeaters, no nonsense, just me straight to her. That, that's not undoable for GMRS. It's just gonna require some equipment and some testing and some things. It's gonna require a system to do it. But if your communication needs are much more limited, like, you know, half a mile to a mile and a half, get a couple of handhelds, get a license, teach your family how to use them, and you should be ready to rock and roll. But no matter what your need is, I encourage everyone out there to consider, is GMRS the right radio service for me? Should I be looking at ham? And consider the same thing I ran into. I have people that are by default in my group that are not going to get ham licenses. Don't want to invest the time into it, don't want to invest the trouble. And I am a big believer in you don't you don't bring anybody into preparedness by fighting them. You bring them in by meeting them where they're at. So ham not being the best solution, GMRS was because of the licensing requirements and everything. And this, I'm meeting my group where they're at. Um, this has a low barrier to entry. It has certainly, you know, limited capabilities compared to like ham HF. Although quite frankly, most of your hams out there are technician classes and they can't mess around with HF anyway. So consider that this might be a tool in the toolbox. How far down that road you go is really up to your needs. Do you get a handheld and stop there or do you wind up like diving down the radio dork rabbit hole and see how deep it is? But we'll talk more about this in the future and I'm going to start doing more of these kinds of more more of these kinds of content where like I talk about a subject, I talk through like how I've prepared, how my family's prepared, what our thought process is um, in a different way than we do on the podcast, which is just me and my buddy Andrew sitting at our desk streaming, talking about things. But I actually want to be able to like show y'all and demonstrate how some of these things work, how they're put together and talk through why I did some of these things. Cause some of these things just don't make sense for y'all's application, but some of them might. And the, the comment I get, I kept getting over and over and over specific to uh, comms is comms is sorcery. Comms is complicated. Comms is difficult. And uh, frankly, it can be. Like there's a lot, there's a lot to it. But the basics that you need to have a functional communications plan are not that complicated. So that's why I wanted to start talking through like what, what, my, the vein I've gone into, what this offers, what are the complications, what are the limitations, and if this fits for you, then I can help send you down the road to get you know get set up this way. And if this doesn't work for you, if this doesn't fulfill your needs, I'm going to point you towards people who can fulfill those needs for you. But no matter what your no matter what your version of off grid communications is, I'm encouraging everybody to develop an off grid comms plan to make this as serious a focus in preparedness as we have you know firearms and food and how to build a fire and all this other stuff that we keep saying that hey we in the preparedness community you all need to know this because i'm going to tell you that when i was in the military the things that got very very stridently pounded into us was you know the old the old basics of shoot move communicate well, those are just infantry tasks, but you notice communicates in there because if you're not communicating with your buddies, you're not coordinating. If you're not coordinating, then you're one knucklehead trying to fight another knucklehead. But if there's a whole bunch of y'all communicating, you can make all of your efforts work together and then it's really, really hard to keep you down because there's a bunch of y'all working together, pulling your effort together. Well, if I can't communicate with anyone outside of your shot, then I'm just one knucklehead. 
off-grid comms gives us that ability to communicate with people over the horizon, outside of, height of, outside of what we can see or who we can talk to by shouting. And that can be an incredible benefit to your group, to your tribe, to your survival plan. So give it some thought. Um, jump into the comments and let me know if all of this sailed straight over your head, if this was way too dumbed down because some of the explanations I gave, especially like when it came to like cell, cell towers and cell phones, I am fully prepared to admit that was like me dumbing it down as much as possible just to illustrate the point. Uh, this, the cellular network is way more complicated than one tower and two phones, but I'm trying to like, you know, pack these things down. So, um... If you want to hear more about this, more specifics, if you want to hear less about this, want me to get back onto another topic, just leave all that in the comment section, and I'll talk to you all next time. Bye, everybody.